Hi everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be starting our abnormal unit and we're going to be kind of doing a little inter introduction to psychological disorders. So just to give you guys a little bit of background and context on how common mental illness is, right? So these are statistics taken from the National Institute of Mental Health. And, you know, I think recently the, you know, media society has done a, has done a great job with kind of normalizing uh, mental illness and, and showing that there are lots of people who struggle with mental illness that doesn't make you um, weird or something bad or wrong and you don't need to hide it, right? So about 20% of Americans 18 and older and about 17% of youth, right, have some sort of diagnosable mental disorder. And if you look, 50% of all mental illness begins by age 14 and 75% begins by age 24. Um, and this talks a little bit about some of the more common ones, which are anxiety disorders and mood disorders. You might think a little bit about mood is um, depression is one of the mood disorders you've heard of. And, you know, suicide is the second leading cause of death among people between ages 10 and 34. So while people don't always want to talk about mental illness, um, it is something we're talking about more often. And it's something that's really important to talk about because it impacts a lot of us. And we there's lots that we can do as a society to help uh, people who are struggling with a mental disorder. Okay, so first of all, we need to talk about how you even know if you have a mental disorder. Lots of us have behaviors that are kind of weird or different, or you might say like abnormal, but that doesn't mean you have a disorder, right? So what are the criteria that we use? There's four criteria that you have to use that has to, you know, that everyone's behavior has to fit under. So the first is that you have to deviate from statistical and social norms. An example of this would be an IQ, like if you have below a 70 on an IQ test, you deviate or you're different from the statistical norm, right? The other thing is that you have to deviate from the social norm. So we only judge mental illness based on what is normal in that society because different societies have different behavioral norms. And so I'm not going to judge behavior of somebody in my culture based on someone else's culture. Second thing is dysfunctional, sometimes called maladaptive. Uh, and dysfunctional basically means you're not functioning. So you're not going to work, you're not going to school, you're not getting out of bed, you're not eating, you're not sleeping, you're not taking a shower, you're not taking care of your family, you're not doing anything that is a normal daily task and activity. Harmful to self or others, distress. So you notice that there's Ds here, deviate, dysfunctional, distressful, right? Um, and distrustful is important because, yes, there are some people with mental illness who are harmful to others, but the majority of people with mental illness are harmful to themselves, right? Not to others, okay? And then you're saying, well, Ms. Schaefer, you said there was four, so these are the other two. So there's three Ds, or three Ds, deviant, dysfunctional, distrustful, and then there's two Ps. So the two Ps go together. They're pervasive and persistent. Pervasive means the behavior is in all different parts of your life. So it's not just school. But it's like school and friends and home, etc. And it's not just once or twice or for a week. It's persistent. It's two weeks or more. It's six months. It's repetitive times, that kind of thing. Okay. So a psychological disorders, the way we view them today, is very different than the way we viewed them kind of historically. Ancient treatments for psychological disorders were some kind of scary things, right? Because we used to believe that mental illness was based on kind of this evilness or demonic possession or weakness of the person. So, you know, they were caged, they were beaten, burned. You can see um, they had, you know, the drilled holes into the skull to remove evil forces. This started to shift with Phil Philip Pennell and his kind of um, insistence that mental illness was not demonic possession, but something that was in the in the mind, in the brain, right? Something medical, right? Starting to think about it less like um, a, a weakness, right? And more like you would think about diabetes or cancer, etc. So the models that we use or the explanations that we currently have for psychological disorders follow our perspectives of psychology. So you're going to see again the overlap. So the biological model focuses on physiological and biochemical, genetics, brain, neurotransmitters, all those kinds of things. Psychoanalytic model focuses on the unconscious, right? Because that's what psychoanal psychoanalytic perspective focuses on, that disorders are the result of unconscious conflicts. Cognitive behavioral model combines the cognitive perspective and the behavioral to say that disorders are the result of like learning things, like learning maladaptive ways, so like through rewards or punishments, or thinking maladaptively, like having false beliefs or believing things that aren't true um, that can then help develop um, into a mental illness. 
And then the last one is a little different than what we talked about before, but it's just kind of a combination of things. It's called the diathesis stress model. So this is saying that they believe that biological predisposition, so it's kind of like the biological model, like you're born with a predisposition, so maybe a genetic or a brain difference or a brain imbalance, chemical imbalance, but you may never get a disorder if something doesn't trigger it in your life. The way that I like to explain this kind of, although I don't love the gun analogy, is that we all come loaded, right? All our gun, if, we're, if we are a gun, our gun comes loaded, right? With our genetic brain chemical makeup. And some people, something in their life uh, presses the trigger, some stress, and, and the gun goes off, and then that would develop into a disorder, while other people, they may have the same makeup, the same loaded gun, but it never triggers. Of course, you guys know, right, now that we're nearing towards the end of the course, that everything in psychology is not one or the other, but it's a combination. So today, most people, even if they favor one of these four models, like even if they favor cognitive behavioral because they're a therapist and they talk to their clients about ways that they can change their thinking or they're biologically inclined because they're a psychiatrist and they prescribe medicine. They do know that all of these things matter, that bio matters, psycho, psychological matters, and sociocultural influences matter, that they all work together to produce psychological disorders. Okay, so we kind of know a little bit about the way that people like explain why we develop disorders, but there's a really important piece of this, which is then classifying the disorder. Like, how do I know if you have OC, obsessive compulsive disorder, or a phobia, or schizophrenia, or bi uh, bipolar disorder, or depression, right? Like, how do I know? So there is a book called the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. So diagnostic in that clinicians, um, therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, medical doctors, you know, social workers, they use this to diagnose different disorders. The, the book has the name of the disorder and then the symptoms, for how long the symptoms should last, age groups, what they look like, etc. Okay, and the goal of this is to help psychologists and psychiatrists and other mental health or other health professionals accurately diagnose disorders. The most recent ones got about 200 disorders uh, compared to the, the one in the 1950s, which uh, had only about 60. So over time, each time they come up with a new one, so it's in the fifth one. Actually, there's more than that because sometimes there's like a fourth and half. But regardless, they, they adjust it, right? So an example, and they adjust it based on our society and our norms and, and our new information and our new beliefs. So an example would be like homosexuality used to be in the DSM, but now that we have more information and knowledge and um, background on homosexuality, we now understand the biological underpinnings of it and it's no longer in the DSM, right? It's no longer labeled as a disorder. So over time, things will be added and taken away based on how we understand um, different things in our society. The goals of the DSM are to provide a common language. So we're all using the same names for disorders and the same symptoms to give specific symptoms. So I know if you have obsessive compulsive disorder or if you have a phobia of germs, like those are different things. But technically people who have obsessive compulsive disorder could be also be afraid of germs. So it's like, how do I know which one you have? This book helps me. Um, and then it gives comprehensive guidelines. So it's, you know, very, like, it's not just like, oh, here's this one symptom. It's like five or six, seven, eight, nine, ten symptoms, depending on the disorder. And then it gives a whole background of, you know, the disorder and kind of a history of it and that kind of thing. Um, so that you can, as a clinician or as a doctor, as a mental health or health professional, you can diagnose. It is, it is reliable, right? It helps make us more reliable in diagnosing. But... It's also dangerous because once somebody gets labeled with a disorder, like you have obsessive compulsive disorder, then, well, what if I'm trying to treat you and I decide and I see that in your chart, like, oh, you have OCD. And then you start doing some things and I start seeing everything you do as part of your OCD. But it might not be. It might just be like it's cold and flu season, so you're washing your hands a lot. So your hands are really dry, maybe bleeding. Right, but then I think, oh, like they must wa hand wash compulsively. So it's really important that we don't label or that we don't use the labels and that people don't just see people as, you know, oh, that person's an obsessive compulsive or oh, that person's a schizophrenic. That they are like a person with schizophrenia or a person with obsessive compulsive disorder. Just like you're a person with diabetes, right? Um, because it's only part of who you are and not everything um, that's all about you and all, all your being.
right? So that's all for now, AP Psychos. And remember, psychology is flipping awesome.